There's something terribly wrong with my son. There's something terribly wrong with my son. He is only four months old. But I can still tell that he isn't acting like himself. He used to laugh whenever I made funny faces. But now he just stares at me. He stares at me with a blank yet strange expression. He used to cry at night just like a normal infant. But now he just lies there. Looking at the ceiling from the comfort of his crib. It's downright weird. I am not even sure if he's sleeping anymore. Every time I get up in the middle of the night to check on him. He's just lying there with that same facial expression. Staring at nothing. He stares at nothing that is. Until I enter the room. Then he turns his attention to me. I don't like it. I truly. Don't. I decided to take the little guy to the doctor's office shortly after this string of occurrences began. As unsettling as the ordeal seemed. I was more concerned than anything else. This was my only child after all. And being a single parent tends to leave little room for me to do much else but worry. Sometimes I wish I had someone to share the burden with. For now. It's just me and him. Upon arriving at the doctor's office. I noticed that there were others in the waiting room. A mother. Her son. And. Their service dog I am fairly certain the mother was deaf. The boy looked to be about three years of age. He looked over at us and smother in lawed but his amused demeanor was abruptly replaced with what appeared to be a look of terror. He scrambled over to his mom's leg and hid behind it. This is when the dog looked over at us and began barking. Wildly. It was the weirdest thing. The mother managed to calm both her son and dog down and the three of them took their turn with Dr. Harrison. They eventually left. Leaving only my son and me. We continued to wait while Dr. Harrison prepared for our appointment. The time that then passed must have amounted to only a few mere minutes. But it felt like a hell of a lot longer. I could see my son staring at me out of the corner of my field of vision. I could feel his eyes piercing through mine. Even though I refused to look back at him. I can't explain it. But an odd sense of anxiety began growing within me. Luckily Dr. Harrison came out and saved me from my private anguish. It sounds awful. But I could not bear to be alone with my son any longer. I spoke with Dr. Harrison and explained everything that had been going on. Being careful not to tell him about. What had just happened in the waiting room. I didn't want him thinking I was crazy. He performed the usual tests on my son and told me that he was a perfectly normal and healthy baby. He even told me that I was lucky that he was so calm at his age. Lucky? Really? I could not wrap my head around this. No I wasn't. And no. My son was not normal. Normal babies don't act this way. They just don't. I could have ignored the situation and chalked it up to an odd phase that he was going through one that would hopefully pass in the coming months. But not only did it not pass. It also became much. Much worse. I tucked my son into his crib just a few nights ago and tried my best to ignore the blank glance that he threw my way. I turned off the light and went to bed. This was my normal routine. At roughly 3 in the morning. I woke up. I don't know why I woke up at such an odd time I usually sleep through the night like a baby. For lack of a less ironic phrase. I am however glad that I woke when I did due to what I found upon waking. Well. Glad in a sense. There. On all fours. Crawling about on my bed. Was none other than my son. How was that even possible? I quickly. Looked over at the crib. It was just how I left it. There was no way he could have crawled out of there at his age. He surely would have hit the floor with a loud thud and injured himself. So how exactly did he get from his crib to my bed? How? I put my son back in his crib and tried to go back to sleep. I found this task to be nearly impossible as I couldn't get the image of my son out of my head. When he was crawling on my bed. He was crawling towards me. Not only this. But he still had that blank expression on his face staring at me as he crawled. His eyes never wavering. He. Didn't blink not even once. Why was he crawling in my direction? What would he do when he finally reached me? The questions that father in lawed my frightened brain were too much for me to simply go back to sleep. I stayed up for the rest of the night and spent most of it staring at my son's crib. Eventually. My weariness did catch up with me. Shortly after the sun came up over the horizon. I passed out. It must have been a good hour before I woke up again. After rubbing my eyes a few times and looking over at the crib. I realized something. My son was not in it. I jumped. Up quickly and investigated. I tossed his blankets around. Only to find that it really was empty. He was gone. I looked over at my bed but he was not there either. 
I turned my apartment upside down looking for him. I checked every room every little nook and cranny I could possibly find. While doing this, there was quite a large knot in the pit of my stomach. I could neither tell if I was worried for my son's safety, or if I was just plain scared. Perhaps it was a bit of both. I finished scouring my apartment and went back to my room to catch my breath. What I saw nearly took it away. Again, there, lying in his crib, was my son. As calm as could be, I walked over to the crib and just stared at him. He, of course, stared back with that unnerving expression of his. I realized then that I was truly frightened of an infant. I looked at him for a few more moments before speaking. What, are you? His eyes widened upon hearing me speak. I cannot be certain, but I think that maybe, for just a split second, my son might have grinned at me. It has been almost a week since my son crawled up onto my bed somehow. Since then, I have set up a video camera in the room just to see what it might catch. The camera makes me feel safer than I did before. I know it sounds ridiculous, but I think it is the camera that's keeping him from doing anything else. Either way, at least I managed to get a little bit of sleep at night now that it's there. The camera is of a very decent quality. It has night vision. HD audio capture everything I need to watch over the actions of my son at night. If he even so much as moves a limb, I will see and hear it. I finally had a way to combat my woes. But setting up this expensive piece of equipment did make me feel foolish. It's one thing to monitor your child for their own safety. But I was in fact spying on my son to see if he was up to something. It wasn't for his safety. It was for mine. It sounds crazy. I know. But what happened next did confirm my suspicions. If only to a small extent. Until last night the footage was completely normal. My son. Slept through the night as I tossed and turned I think that perhaps he was pretending to sleep for the camera's sake. The second night of recording. However. Was a bit strange. The first few hours were normal, much like the night before, but that is when my son did something surprising. Using his tiny, undeveloped arms and legs, he stood up in his crib, using the bars to lean on. He adjusted himself to face the camera and stared at it. He stared for a solid 12 and a half minutes with that horribly unsettling, blank expression of his before lying back down. The part that really gets me is about halfway through the clip where he actually lets go of the bars and is standing up on his own for a few moments. This, to me, was utterly inexplicable. I was shocked. A plethora of theories bombarded my mind at an alarming rate. From the mundane to the sinister. Maybe he was just advanced for his age. Having the brother in law to not only stand up straight, but also escape the confines of his crib and crawl up onto my bed like he'd done almost a week previously. I quickly discarded this thought, deeming it nearly impossible. Perhaps he isn't my son at all. Maybe he is something else entirely. Not even a he. But in it, I discarded this theory as well. Not wanting to give in to any. Notions of the supernatural. It just wasn't logical. I knew I would have to speak with Dr. Harrison again to potentially put my weary mind at ease. I had already made an appointment to see Dr. Harrison again later in the week. But after seeing this footage, I had him squeeze me in early. I made my way to his office once again. Son and all and patiently sat in the waiting room. I paid no attention to my son's blank stare, like before, but it still made me feel uneasy. As we waited, his stare became increasingly more difficult to ignore. For whatever reason, I felt compelled to look back at him, even though I knew it would make me anxious to do so. Even so, I turned my head downwards and stared at him. His eyes, there was something wrong with his eyes. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but there was something terribly off about them. They were the same eyes, but they still seemed different. I don't quite know how to explain it. Luckily, Dr. Harrison came out of hiding, putting an end to our nerve-wracking staring match. What a relief. I don't know why, but I feel like I would have just kept staring at my son, seemingly to no end, rather than dwelling on my inner, fearful inclinations. I focused on the task at hand. Skipping the seemingly normal parts of the video, I showed Dr. Harrison the odd occurrence from the second night. He watched in awe as my four-month-old son stood up on his own and faced the camera. Becoming impatient, I asked for his thoughts on it. You know what he had to say? He actually congratulated me on having such a well-developed child. 
He said that my son was advanced for his age and that he was glad to have helped him along in the process. As if he had anything to do with it. Telling him about the night he crawled onto my bed. He did no results either it only added to his already oversaturated ego. I was absolutely flabbergasted by his reaction. In any case. I did manage to get the receptionist to refer me to a specialist in infant behavior on my way out. I desperately needed someone to talk to that wasn't completely oblivious to the matter. I went home both angry at Dr. Harrison. And exhausted from the ordeal mentally as well as physically. I put my son in his crib. Being careful not to look at his eyes again. As much as I felt the need to. I then went out to the living room and sat down on the couch in an attempt to unwind. I shut my eyes for but a moment and quickly fell asleep. I dreamt in my dream. I was sitting on the couch. Just like I was before falling asleep. I tried getting up. But my legs and arms felt very heavy and sluggish. I gave in to the situation and just sat there. I took a look around and noticed that the room looked a little bit different. The frames I had up on the wall containing pictures of my wife and son were now empty. It was then that I began to feel dizzy as a strange knot grew in my stomach. I felt a need to look over to my left. Towards the bedroom. There. Standing up on his own. Was my son. He was at the. Doorway to the bedroom. Just staring at me. Before I could even privately react. He began walking. In an awkward slush of movement. My son walked towards me. His stride was grotesque and unnatural. Causing the knot in my stomach to grow larger. He continued to walk until finally reaching a spot just a few inches from where I was sitting. He reached his hand out towards me as I watched in horror. What was he going to do? Why was this happening? Why? I woke up before my son's hand could reach me. I jumped up in fear. Still half asleep. And ran into the bedroom. I. Rushed over to the crib and a wave of relief overcame me. He was still in there. Staring blankly up at me. Like he always did. Thank goodness. I walked back over to the couch and sat down to collect my thoughts. It seems that even in my sleep I am not safe. This mess that I've found myself in is causing me not only a great deal of stress, but also to have nightmares. I need it to end. I will be giving the specialist a call shortly to set up an appointment. In the meantime, it's back to square one trying to get some shadow while recording the actions of my son. In the hopes of finding some answers. It seems that this is what our little fam mother in law has come to. We now lie at the cross section of strange and completely mad. I for one just want everything to be over and done with so I can finally get a good night's rest. I have called Ems. DeWitt. The specialist. And we've set up an appointment for next week. I would feel enthused about this. Had the situation not escalated last night. It seems my son's behavior has taken another turn for the worst. Unfortunately. I seem to be the one and only target for his nightly antics. Many times during this ordeal. Including now, I have asked but a simple question that I can never seem to get a clear answer to why me. While we're on the subject of questions, another one has haunted me as of late why does my son act in the manner that he does? I really need to know why. And then there's the dreams what is their significance? I could understand if it were only the one. But that is not the case. It seems that every time I close my eyes, a new father-in-law reel begins rolling. With every new movie starring my son as the antagonist. Every narrative is structured differently. But the plot remains the same. I am always frozen and unable to move whilst my son finds new. And unique ways to terrify me. Before finally making his way to wherever I am. I then wake up in a cold sweat. As frightened as I was while asleep. I suppose it doesn't matter how each narrative is woven I always end up caught in my son's malevolent web. Even so. These nightmares could just be the byproduct of an overactive, anxiety ridden imagination. They are probably meaningless. At least that is what I tell myself to feel better about them. But that doesn't necessarily mean they aren't meaningless. Besides, the fear I feel while dreaming is nothing compared to what I feel while awake. Like the feeling I had last night. For instance, instead of explaining to you the events as they unfolded, I will start off by portraying them through the footage. If only for the sake of transparency, you will understand what I mean as we begin. Up to a specific point, the footage was almost identical to the video I captured the other night. My son stood up on his own and faced the camera, followed by what I am now convinced might be a perturbed and menacing gaze. This is when things get a little strange or should I say stranger. After a few moments of my son staring, 
The camera seems to fall off of the shelf that I had placed it on. Landing lens first onto the floor. That is when I woke up. Before continuing, I would like to share some of my thoughts on what might have happened. It is true that the camera may have simply fallen off of the shelf. But I swear that I placed it in a position that left it secure. It also may be important to note that nothing else that was on the shelf had fallen off. So whatever did cause the camera's untimely decent didn't disturb anything else. I personally believe that my son somehow caused the camera to fall when he stared at it. I am aware of how that sounds. But it isn't as far-fetched when considering everything else that has been going on. I am not really sure one way or the other. For now we'll get back to the incident in question. From this point forward, I will explain the events from my perspective. If only for a clearer picture than the fallen camera can provide. I woke to a loud thud and jumped up immediately. I was worried that it might have been my son falling out of his crib. Upon further inspection, I noticed that he, once again, had vanished. After tossing his blankets around in his crib looking for him, I heard the once fam mother and lawyer sound of my son crying. I abruptly stopped my search and stood still. Stunned, my son had not displayed a single emotion since his odd behavior started, let alone shed a tear. I was most certainly taken aback by this. I took a moment to process everything before regaining my composure. The sound of my son crying was coming from the direction of the living room. I ran out there as fast as I could, but the crying stopped almost as suddenly as it had begun. I turned the light on, but my son was nowhere to be found. The crying started up again a few moments later. Only then it was coming from the kitchen around the corner. I ran out there only to have the crying stop once more and to find that my son was not there either. What the hell was going on? I sat down on the kitchen floor and attempted to calm myself down. I hadn't noticed before, but I was shaking from the adrenaline. Why was this happening? How was any of this possible? I asked myself these questions but knew not the answers, nor how to find them. I couldn't even find my son for that matter. It seemed my nightmares were bleeding into my waking life. And there wasn't a single thing that I could do to stop it. I continued to sit on the floor, unable to keep from shaking. This is when the sound of crying started up again. This time, it was coming from back in the bedroom. Where this impromptu, late night adventure began. As I ran from the kitchen to the bedroom, my heart pounded in my chest. I was scared. I didn't know what I would find upon entering my bedroom. But whatever it could have been simply scared the hell out of me. Even still, I had to keep running. I had to see if my son was safe. Even if he wasn't himself. And so, that's exactly what I did. Upon entering the room, the sound of crying ceased. I ran over to the crib and saw my son. Lying there. He was once again staring at me with that eerie expression of his. I was relieved that he was safe but still frightened by what had happened. My breathing became irregular and a tightness formed in my chest. It was the onset of a panic attack. I think, I needed to take yet another moment to pull myself together. I walked over to my bed and sat down, hoping that I, wouldn't fall apart right then and there. I had to stay focused and keep this fam other in loy functional somehow. The stress and lack of sleep were taking a very large toll on me. Despite this, I tried my best to explain the night's events to myself in a logical fashion. It became quickly apparent that I could not. While replaying these events in my head. However. I did realize something. I stood up and walked back over to the crib where my son was lying. I hesitantly reached my hand out towards him. I carefully brushed my fingers across his cheeks and noticed that they were not wet. There had been no tears. My appointment with Ems. DeWitt was earlier today. I must say that I do feel a bit strange. I don't really think I can trust anyone anymore. My son and I are going to have to deal with this issue on our own. It is apparent to me that nobody can help us. Not Dr. Harrison. Not Ems. Do it not a single human being on this earth. As alone as this revelation makes me feel. I somehow feel empowered at the same time. It has put things into perspective and is allowing me to take my life into my own hands no matter how messy my situation is. Deep down I know that I can. Get through this. At least I hope I can. Allow me to explain what happened. After another restless night with my son. I sluggishly began getting ready for my appointment with Ems. DeWitt. For whatever reason. I was very nervous. This was odd. As I had no reason to feel that way. I should have been excited if anything. After all. 
this quite possibly could have been the first step in helping my son with whatever ailed him. Even still, I could not shake the feeling. Skipping breakfast due to a loss of appetite from my nerves, I quickly left with my son. The drive took roughly 40 minutes. As Ams, DeWitt's office was in the next town over. I wish that I could say that the drive went smoothly. But it did not. About 15 minutes in, I decided to check on my son with the aid of my rear view mirror. He had been silent the whole time. But I put off on checking on him until that moment due to my own fear of his unnatural gaze. I knew I wouldn't like what I saw when looking in my mirror. But I did not know to what extent. Upon looking at my mirror, I noticed that my son was gone. His booster seat was still there. But it was empty. My heart sunk as I quickly turned into the breakdown lane and slammed on my brakes. I stumbled out of my car in haste and opened the back door. I scoured the entire vehicle looking for him. I flipped over his booster seat, tore everything out of the car that wasn't tied down, and nearly ripped up the upholstery looking for him. Despite my best efforts, my son was nowhere to be found. I wondered for a moment if I had left my son at home. I tried to remember everything I had done that morning, but it was all a blur. I blamed this on my lack of sleep. Just before convincing myself that I needed to drive back home and see if he was there, I realized that I hadn't looked everywhere just yet. I know it sounds a bit crazy, but I felt a need to check the trunk. It is true that I didn't look there, but it was of course with good reason. How in the world could a baby get from his booster seat to the trunk in a moving car? But then again, how could he do any of the things he had been doing recently? Maybe, just maybe, my son was in there. In a confused stupor, I reluctantly unlocked and opened the trunk. Surely enough, my son was there. He was lying on his back in the same way that he lies in his crib, and was of course staring up at me. I would have been shocked that he was in there, but I was more so fed up. My son's hijinks were mentally exhausting. They continued to take their toll on me, even in middle of the highway. I wanted it all to stop. I put my son back in his booster seat and got back on the road pretending that nothing had happened. This was not before checking him for any injuries or bruising. There were none. This didn't surprise me either. Nothing did. I chose to focus on the road and my journey ahead as opposed to the peculiarities that seemed to control my day-to-day -day life. It was all I could do to keep from going. Completely and irrevocably insane. I arrived at M's. DeWitt's office a little late. Due to the incident on the highway. Because of this, I quickly grabbed my son luckily he was still there and rushed into the building. Hoping that she would still take us. I hurried up to her office door and opened it. Revealing two people behind it. The two people were none other than Dr. Harrison and presumably M's. DeWitt. They had apparently been discussing something before I barged in. What the hell? Confused. I nearly shouted at them. Demanding to know what was going on. Dr. Harrison came over to me. Ignoring my son altogether and placed a hand on my shoulder. He told me that Ems. DeWitt was not a specialist in infant behavior. She was a specialist in adult behavior. In other words, he said, she was a psychiatrist. I was dumbfounded. Was this some sort of intervention? Why the secrecy? What exactly was their motive here? Again I ask, why me? I tried to turn around and leave. But Dr. Harrison pleaded with me. He seemed genuinely concerned about my well-being. As much as I disliked the idea of talking to a therapist, this was the first time Dr. Harrison had shown any real concern during this ordeal. I decided that it would be in my best interest to humor him. If only as a courtesy, I had thought about seeing a therapist anyways. So what did I really have to lose? Dr. Harrison said he would take care of my son during the session, so I could be alone with Ems. DeWitt. He said there could be no distractions or disruptions. I knew I could trust him with my son. So I handed him over. Dr. Harrison awkwardly held him. Almost as if he'd never held an infant before. This was weird. But I brushed it off. Before long. I was sitting in a chair across from the one and only Ems. DeWitt. It was time to open up. It seemed. Ems. DeWitt was young and attractive. She had long black hair tied up in a bun. Glasses. A white button-up shirt. And a black skirt that came down to her knees. Her demeanor was alluring, and her voice possessed a certain charm. About it, it was comforting as well as pleasing. 
there was just the right amount of sex appeal there to still consider her appearance to be one of elegance and class. I could see right through this ploy. The manner in which she conducted herself was created to make it easier for me to spill my guts. So to speak. It was a ruse to get me to divulge my inner workings my secrets and darkest thoughts. I decided that I would not succumb to her prying ways. We began by talking about normal things. I talked about my place of employment. My home. And the people I. Associated with. Without noticing it. Her questions became more and more intrusive. She asked about my childhood. My parents. And important events in my life. I didn't notice her verbal intrusions at first. Because she shared with me her past as well. With every story or answer I gave her. She offered one to me in return. We even laughed together about some of these stories. It was nice. To be honest. It felt like I was on a first date. She was very easy to talk to. And I had no issue with giving her the information that she desired. But that is when she went too far. After discussing some arbitrary events from my college. Days. Ms. DeWitt seemingly jumped the gun and asked me about my wife. Like glass abruptly shattering. The immersion was broken. Still some other in law to some first dates I've had. We began to argue. And I mean really argue. It went on for what must have been an hour. We even began yelling at each other. I don't know why. But it felt like I was fighting with a good friend. At times it even felt like I was fighting with my wife. I can say now that M's. DeWitt is very good at her job. And is quite the actor. Like many fights I've had with friends. This one eventually came to an end in a calm and collected manner. We. Actually made up and apologized to each other. It even felt like we were closer because of it. I guess there was just something about this woman that made it difficult to stay mad at her. In any case. I decided to discuss with her what had happened to my wife. She didn't even have to ask again I just started talking. Bewildered and surprised. She sat down on her desk and intently listened. My wife and I had a picture perfect relationship. I met her in college and we instantly became close friends. We knew everything about each other and depended on one another for support during tough times. We could always count on. The other one being there. It was a great feeling to have. Just knowing this. We knew that we liked each other. But never once did we talk about it. On the day of our college graduation I simply pulled out a ring and asked her to marry me. She shouted the word yes at me before attacking me with a tight embrace. It was a very spur of the moment thing for me to do. I didn't plan it either the idea came to mind that very day. Even still. I have never been more sure of anything in my entire life. After settling down and putting our college degrees to use. My wife became pregnant with our son. It was not planned. But the two of us could not have been happier about it. I for one could think of no other person I wanted to have a child with. Things were looking up for us. Until about 9 months later. That is. I won't go into too much detail. But my wife died while giving birth to our son. The list of complications that lead to her demise was a very long one. It was so long in fact. That it made her death seem inevitable. I have since come to terms with her passing. Putting all of my love and affection into our son not only for my sake but for hers. That is why I am so desperate in my hunt for answers. He is all I have left of her. He is all I have left of us. Ams? DeWitt did not interrupt me even once. She was turning out to be not only a great listener. But also a great friend. I actually felt good after opening up to her. I'd never told anyone about my wife before. Or at least not to that length. It was cathartic. In a way. But of course. Ams? DeWitt and I were not friends. We had just met. This was a business call a favor to Dr. Harrison. Her following. Questions reflected this. After hearing my long and drawn out tale. M's? DeWitt asked about my son and what had happened to him. I had no idea what she was talking about. She asked confusing questions about what happened to him right after he was born. I simply told her that I took him home. She continued her assault of questions. But my answer was the same each time. What did this have to do with anything anyways? Seeing as she could not get through to me. M's? DeWitt took off her glasses and stopped asking questions. Instead, she decided to tell me some things. The first thing she told me caused a sharp chill to resonate throughout my entire body. She told me that my son was dead. Before continuing, she gave me a moment to react. I most certainly did. I yelled at her like I did before. But she did not yell back. She was letting me alleviate my own anger. 
It seemed. I attempted to storm off. But she insisted that I sit down and listen to what she had to say. Whatever pseudo friendship we may have had ended the moment she told me my son was no longer alive. But she still had a comforting charm about her. I decided to listen to her. But that did not mean I had to believe her. I sat back down in my chair and remained silent. I looked at Ems. Do it angrily while she spoke nothing but lies. She told me that due to the same complications that killed my wife. My son too passed away. Shortly after being born. It was her expert opinion that. Unable to cope with the loss of my wife and son. I had a nervous breakdown. The breakdown was so severe that my brain needed a way to repair itself. That is where my son comes in. Apparently it was easier for me to pretend as well as hallucinate that my. Son was still alive. Rather than come to terms with both his and her deaths. A few unexpected tears rolled down my cheeks when she told me this. I am not exactly sure why. Ems? DeWitt continued by telling me that Dr. Harrison was very concerned over all of this. He tried his best to play along. But he couldn't stand to see me like this anymore. It seems that every time I went to his office with my son. He simply pretended he was there. He also gave fake reactions when looking at blank footage of an empty crib. He did this for me as a friend. Knowing that I had lost my famother in Loy. I could not take any more of what. She was saying. It was too much. I attempted once more to get up and leave. But she begged me to stay. She told me to think of the little things that have happened to me. She said my brain was trying desperately to tell me that my son wasn't there. The reason I noticed my son's eyes looking so off is because the one and only time I saw his eyes was at the hospital. After he had passed. He never laughs or cries because only living babies can do these things. The crying I heard that one night was only the memory of him crying when he was born the only time he ever shed a tear. The pictures. Vanishing in my dream were showing me that both my wife and son are truly gone. Last but not least was the terrifying nature of it all. According to Ems. DeWitt. My son and his antics did not scare me. What truly frightened me was coming to terms with his death. I let her finish before getting up and angrily walking by her to the door. She could tell I didn't believe a word of what she had told me. As such. She tried one last time to reach out to me. She reminded me of how impossible everything was that had occurred with my son. She begged me to let her help. I turned around before opening. The door. Looked her straight in the eye. And said one last thing to her. I am sorry Ems. DeWitt. But I will never give up my son.